Welcome. You're tuned into Life is a Sacred Journey. Every week, we bring a new perspective to aging and caregiving. Here is your host, Michelle Pope. Good morning and welcome to Life is a Sacred Journey. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you to Life is a Sacred Journey. It is Friday morning and it's 8 a.m. And it's um, raining here in California, which is good because we need the rain. And I just want to also take a moment to recognize that we are in the month of February and it is Black History Month. And, you know, take a moment to learn about our Black citizens, uh, African-American citizens across the diaspora who have done things that have supported our lifestyles as well as contributed to the building of the United States of America in so many ways. And so um, take time to do that. And I am going to admit our guest today. And as I admit her, I just want to tell you a little bit more about Reverend Jocelyn Jones. I had the opportunity yesterday. Yesterday was my first day to be with my granddaughter. So I spent the day taking care of her. It was just an amazing thing. This seven-month-old baby who reminded me how marvelous life can be. And when I was there, when she was taking a little nap, I looked up Reverend Jocelyn Jones in preparation for her time with us this morning. And oh, my heart was so warm that this is a person who resonates with my own journey. I, my book hasn't been written yet, but it's it's coming. She's an entrepreneur. She is a woman who um, became a social worker after getting her Bachelor of Science and, and, and then decided that wasn't enough, that really going back and getting a, a master's in theology, which you all know, I've done that too. You know, there's something that happens to us when we're on this wonderful life purpose journey that we just want to seek information. As I told you, I, I never wanted to become a pastor. That wasn't the reason for this. It was more about examining how we navigate this space when we're born into this flesh and, and live this wonderful journey. But Reverend Jocelyn J. Jones, I love this. I love her name even, Jocelyn J. Jones. I can remember it, right? Is also a woman who has worked with individuals who are dealing and needing Christian counseling. There is a difference. There is a difference, my loves. And um, she's going to talk a little bit about that. And then 2019, she published her first book called Breaking the Power of the Mask. And you know, as I said, this woman resonates with me. I'm going to have to meet her in person because I always talk about the mask. And in different periods of our lives, sometimes we're forced into wearing a mask and we have to identify that we are so we can rip it off. And sometimes we need help doing that. So join me this morning, my dear family of Life is a Sacred Journey, and saying good morning, hello, how are you, to Reverend Jocelyn J. Jones. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. I'm so glad to be here with you this morning. I am excited that you're here because on this platform, which you know has had many iterations, uh, because of what we learn from others and, and also on our journey, we change, right? We change. Mm -hmm. um, and in my work with um, folks living and coping and, and thriving with Alzheimer's and dementia and their caregivers, I have learned that there's a part of us that, that has been taught that the life journey um, should be just this thing that just kind of happens and nothing happens to us. We don't, we shouldn't be upset. We should never have stress. And so therefore, sometimes we don't even learn how to cope with those things. We don't learn how, and cope is a weird word too, because when I looked it up in the dictionary, it implies surrender, la, 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 la. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about surrender in a higher place where, where you take the positive with the negative and you marry them so that you can create a new experience for yourself, not avoiding either or. And, mm -hmm. and in your work, I see that you, maybe not in that same way, but I see that you embrace sort of that idea and philosophy. So would you share 
how you got on this journey and 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 draw those those points in and good morning yeah. okay. <laughs> good morning good morning <laughs> Wow, that's such a good question. In terms of my journey, I didn't plan this out by any means, right? I, um, as you mentioned, I had a BA in journalism, actually. And then I started working at a, a television station and realized I wanted to work in the community. And thankfully, I was offered a position at my church to work in the violence prevention department and at the youth center. And while working there, a lot of the young people who I supported, they were experiencing trauma on a high level. Gun violence on the south side of Chicago is still a problem. And so we were losing young people. They were grieving. They didn't know how to deal with their trauma. And trauma wasn't a buzzword. Even at the time when I was getting my master's in social work, we weren't talking about trauma at that level. Yes. And so we we didn't even have a name to what these kids were experiencing as it relates to post, uh, post-traumatic post stress yep. and their behavior and how they were coping with their grief. I remember one time I was talking to a young uh, person at the youth center and I said, you know, it is okay for you to cry. It's okay for you to express your emotions. And she said, Miss Jocelyn, if I cried every time I lost someone to gun violence, I'd be crying all the time. And that just broke my heart because seeing how she didn't have, she was just trying to cope as you use that term. She was just trying to make it mm -hmm. as best as she could. And seeing that it, it changed me. It's that I, I wanted to do something to help those who were experiencing trauma and grief and loss. I also experienced my own trauma, my own, you know, experiences around sexual trauma that really changed me. And I really didn't know how to cope with it. I didn't have the tools. And mm -hmm. thankfully, God was working on me and calling me to seminary to start my own ministry. And that's really when I started doing the work, the work around my own healing, the work getting into counseling, you know, seeing a therapist, beginning to unpack this onion of pain that had been dormant for so long. And I realized over the years in shifting into the space of trauma healing and starting my own counseling practice and starting to lead groups that we are such a pain adverse society. We do not like talking about pain. We do not like talking about our emotions. We like to wear the mask <laughs> to hide our pain. And therefore, this is why many of us have not healed because we don't talk. But I often tell people the only way to heal is to hurt. And you have to begin to, to face the pain from our past and even engage in difficult conversations. And, and for me, that, has, that was a struggle for many years, still now to some extent, to talk about death, to talk about dying. And I know we'll talk about this soon, but even before my dad passed away, I had such a hard time accepting that reality. Yeah, you know, this is so funny because... Um, I, I don't believe that anything happens by accident. I think that um, uh, people come in, in and out of our lives purposely. Um, some stay for the whole journey and others come in for a moment and, and give us the, the, the spiritual food that we need for that moment. And, um, but letting go of a loved one is one of the hardest things that we do. And one of the things that I've learned in um, here at Alzheimer's Services of the East Bay is that it's the never ending death until mm -hmm. the person actually dies because the, the caregiver, the care partner is experiencing this loss, this this cognitive loss, which is a part, which is the personality, right? It's the it's the very thing that we're taught to be attracted to. It's the thing that that my granddaughter was my personality yesterday. It wasn't. She doesn't know anything about my heart, but because I was animated and singing, she's learning to love my personality. My heart is something that she'll get later on down the road. So when we lose that, and we're losing it on a continuum until the point of death, it really does um, speak to what you just said, that this, we don't know how to grieve. We don't know how to grieve in a way of, um, as I said to someone once, um, the initial grief was like, bam, you know, I lost my brother 
towards the end of the pandemic. And it was devastating to me because he was my best friend. He, he is my best friend. Let me just say that he's still, yes, 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 yes. and, 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 um, but the loss just threw me. I, I, I was here in the office and I just was like, oh, and it was so hard and it was so painful. And, and it lasted for a long time. Yes. Because, you, you know, and 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 then there was a friend of mine wrote a book called The Open Broken Heart, Jocelyn. And it that's exactly what happened. My heart was broken, but it opened up to the fact that, wow, I was given that brother. Mm. <laughs> I was mm. given this man in my mm. life. Nobody else got to be his sister, but my baby sister. <laughs> oh, you're all right. <laughs> Sorry, Tony. It's important got... too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, you know how that goes. He's my brother. <laughs> um, but he got to be my brother. I got to right. be his sister. But but to get to there, I have to tell you, has taken over a decade of counseling before this even happened. Um, and what you just said resonated with me because we, as people of color, um, and um, have been taught. To, and it was through the the experience of slavery we, we were taught to swallow our pain, yes, um, and to never express it because it's it's where that statement comes from. I'll beat you till you cry. I mean, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. so so we start there, and it's in our DNA, and we bring it forth into wherever we are parenting, living, schooling, whatever, and what you're saying is there's a time in our lives when we can embrace transformation. What did that look like for you? Oh, that that did not happen to for me until recently. And I'm saying okay. it's ironic because I worked in this field. I started my counseling practice. I started conducting trauma healing groups. But I had never dealt with grief that was extremely personal until about two years ago when my dad made his transition. And so it was all theory when I was t doing grief counseling and support until I was experiencing it on a deeper level and saying, oh my goodness. Now, mind you, my dad, prior to uh, his late stage Alzheimer's, he would talk about, there's gonna be a time when I'm not here. There's gonna be a time in which, you know, you're gonna have to live life without me. And these are the things I wanna teach you. And every time he would have this conversation, when I was in my early 20s, even early 30s, I would shut the conversation down. I'd be like, Dad, I don't want to hear it. I would start crying and change the subject. Because the idea of death for someone who has been a constant for me, I just was not willing to, to deal with it. But here's the thing, when it comes to death and loss, this is a reality. Like you can you can run from it all you want to, but at the end of the day, you can have those conversations about planning for someone's transition before they go, or you cannot. But then you can't get the time back once they are gone, because there's been times in which I said, I wish I had these conversations with my dad, but I wasn't at a place where I, I had the tools or the ability to handle those difficult conversations. And so as my dad was making his transition, I mean, he went from... In 2016, it was diagnosed with mild cognitive disorder, I believe is what it's referred to. But uh, he progressively got worse his last two to three years. And it happened to be his last two to three years when we were in the pandemic. And it was very stressful. Uh, it was very difficult because you, you remember in March of 2020, when things went down, it was like social distance, don't go around the elderly and it's kind of like, okay, wait, wait, but these are like, I knew it was my latter, the latter years of my dad's life. I didn't know how much time I had. And you telling me I can't visit my daddy. Yes. And, and so this was very difficult. And so seeing how he was declining at a rapid pace his last two years, I remember having a, a phone conversation with him and my dad, he got on the phone and his conversation was jumbled he wasn't making much sense. It was almost as if he was drunk and I knew he wasn't drunk. It was just, he was struggling. Yes. And when I got off the phone with him, I had to hurry off the phone because I could not barely hold back the tears. I was so upset because I realized he is declining. Yes. 
yes. you know? And, and so for me, I mean, fast forward to answering your question and we can talk more about his I'm transition. So thankful that, no, thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Because it's real. Mm hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. And so you, you talked about like the transformation and, and, and embracing, you know, th this loss or dealing with this loss. Since my dad has made his transition, I I still commune with him as an ancestor. I still have conversations with him. I miss him dearly. Uh, and, you know, I'm I've matured in my understanding around grief and loss because it's still painful but I have had to learn ways to stay connected and honor him uh, through my living uh, because he was so dear and st is still dear to me. Just like you said, your brother's still with you. My dad is still with me. And so I just have to hold on to that as I move forward with life in a different way with him, having a different relationship with my father. Yes. And, you know, and I think I love that you, you, you know, the ancestral word is a great word because it really speaks to that long-term relationship that we have with those that we get to spend um, our lives with. You know, it's, it's, as I, when you came on, I was talking about my granddaughter and this being the first time that, you know, uh, that I could spend an entire day with her. And, um, I realized that how important it was to me as I was driving home, it's because I will not see her to the end of her life. Mm. That that moment, that one moment in time is because, and making it the best was because there will be a day that I will transcend and she is left here. Mm. And that experience of every second with her, cause I get it now, right? I get it. It may be the last. Mm. Um, and so because of that, when we're in journey with each other, especially when it's someone with Alzheimer's or a little person like, like my seven month old who has no words yet, no words. Mm -hmm. um, similar to somebody with Alzheimer's on the other end, no words. Right. How do we, ex how do we create a relationship that transcends all of this? Mm. love yeah it's in the love you know I uh, my dad when he was in the hospital uh, the last month of his life he couldn't talk and uh, he got an infection from falling and uh, we were trying to uh, engage him we were trying to uh, get him to watch home videos we were trying to have him watch TV, show him pictures, and nothing interests him. Oh, okay. And my brother had the idea of um, playing some music that uh, he loved. My dad loved Family Reunion. That was uh -huh. a, a song that he played on vinyl, and it just it was just blasting throughout the house. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I know your dad. Yeah. Oh, I was. I love that song. We love that song, and so. Uh, my brother put it on his phone and started playing. And before we knew it, my dad was singing. He was singing the songs in the hospital. And uh, last name being Jones, we put on me and Mrs. Jones. And he was singing that, just playing the oldies. And the nurses came in like, what, Mr. Jones? <laughs> He's over here singing. And it, it, it brought him joy. Yes. It brought him, you know, like, happiness in that moment to spend and be surrounded by his children who's showing him love even though he could not engage in conversation and that's the thing that I learned when someone's dealing with a cognitive disease dementia Alzheimer's whatever they're struggling with we we have to understand that they can still have moments they can still experience joy at that time even if they can't remember it a minute later and so for us, that's a memory that I hold on to. Even to this day, it makes me smile because I'm like, we brought my dad joy in his last days. We loved him and he felt the love yes. in those last days. Yeah. And, and so a baby, they might not be able to talk or communicate, but they can feel love. And that's what transcends. Mm -hmm. Love is the, it's, it's that, it's the thing that, that's that unspoken language. That's when you go to another country and you refuse to be a tourist 
and you treat people with respect. I always bring this up because whenever I visited other countries and I've seen Americans there, um, kind of rude, kind of rude when you expect people to treat you as you would be treated in your country when you're a guest in mm -hmm. their country. That, that's ridiculous. Why would you go if you want it to be the same experience that you have on in at your at your local address? And so I always like, you know, I always apologize, actually, after I see that experience next, because I want people to understand that sometimes we get in um, spaces where our own personal power takes over and mm -hmm. we don't really understand how to connect with the other. And so this is something that you also have done in your work, connecting with community, connecting with the young people. And, you know, talk a little bit about that, because I, I'm, I'm in that circle now where there are people who want to go in and do too. And I'm saying go in and have an adventure, explore, find out what people need. And that's mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Um, I see, and I, I did do my research. Oh. Um, I see you speaking in that way, you know, go and connect, be intentional in these relationships and stop going in there thinking that you done flew in with your cape. Right. And that those people um, were in this condition just for you, just for right. you. Can you speak to that? Cause yeah, so <laughs> that you can come in like baby Jesus yeah. and say the day. Oh my goodness. That's right. I mean, when we look at community, when we look at um, yeah. any area uh, that might even be struggling with violence or certain issues, there's still such richness inside that community. The power lies within the community. The community knows what it needs. And like you use the example of us going to foreign places, expecting for them to just bow down to our needs and assimilate to us. That's what we do sometimes when we go into community with maybe even good intentions and say, oh, I got all the solutions. This is how you're supposed to do things. This is how you're supposed to be. And the community's like, wait, who are you? And why are you here? And why are you telling us what to do? And so with that, when it comes to engaging in community and community transformation, we have to acknowledge the wealth, the beauty that's already existing there. Now, it might be some support that we can offer through helping to galvanize that. and But they need to be in the forefront. They need to be in the driver's seat mm -hmm. in terms of how this looks. And we're a supporting staff member, supporting team member in that process. But doing community asset mapping, seeing what resources are already there, the needs that are already there, and providing them with any training that they need so they can do the work and sustain the work is where the transformation can take place. And then you become not just the person that comes into, you become a part of. Yeah. Right? You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's what I love about community work. Uh, and I hate, I don't even want to call it work. Just being part of the hood, being a part of the neighborhood of life um, is, is an opportunity to learn something new about someone else as well as myself, you know, mm -hmm. because, yeah. I'm enhanced by by every experience that that I have, even the ones that I've walked away going, wow, that took a lot out of me, right? Because they're not always positive experiences, but 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 li living into that experience has changed me. And then it, you can become an advocate for them, not just spiritually through prayer and meditation, but then you can become an advocate outside in the world as you are when you're doing your uh, public speaking and all of that. If you go to uh, Reverend Jocelyn J. Jones's uh, website, you will see that you um, she's done many uh, public speaking um, engagements. I'm actually thinking about bringing her to California. Um, and, um, you know, it's a Christian counseling company that you can become engaged with. Um, but there's also this wonderful book that came out in 2019 called Breaking the Power of the Mass. Mine is on its way. You know, I can't make it to, I, every time I try to go to Barnes and Noble, which is one of the main bookstore that's left in my neighborhood, which really makes me cry because a lot of the community bookstores are gone now. Um, 
I can't, I can't get anything there. So I have to always order stuff online. So it's coming. And so maybe by the time I, I see you in person, I'll get you to autograph it, but talk about the book. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, I wrote that book because I was the queen of wearing a mask and still sometimes struggle too. Uh, I want to say this about the mask. My understanding of the mask that we wear has evolved because as you mentioned earlier, we had to, especially black and brown people, black women and black men in particular of slavery, we had to wear a mask as a form of protection. We could not show emotion. We couldn't show weakness. We had to lie, la laugh at things that were not funny for slave masters, you know, because of the fact that we had to survive. And so wearing a mask was a defense mechanism. It was a way for us to protect ourselves for so long. And and so for us, I see that as being something that's very common. But even beyond Black people, society perpetuates this idea that we should wear a mask. We should show up a certain way. We see this on social media where everyone is, you know, living their best life, showing them, you know, having all this fun, never showing them, you know, having these struggles. And, and, and so we see that. We see that in the church where we are too blessed to be stressed all the time and, and, and 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 we really too stressed to be depressed. We're depressed, struggling behind the scenes, but no one sees that. Right. And so through the church, through uh, our history, through, you know, social media and culture, we see everyone wearing this mask to project how we think the world should see us. But we're not letting people see our authentic selves. Now, where does this come into play as it relates to our healing? Mm -hmm. If we're consistently wearing a mask of protection, then we are never able to experience intimate relationships with people. People really just don't know us and it prevents us from being able to heal. And that's when we really run into these problems. And so I talk about this in the book, how uh, even though sometimes we might need to wear a mask because it's not a safe environment, just like with COVID, we wore a physical mask in environments where we have high exposure to danger to the virus, but you don't want to wear the mask in the shower, in the bed. It, you know, you don't wear the mask all the time, the physical mask. Mm -hmm. So we can't wear our emotional mask all the time. Like if with our spouse, with our children, with our closest relationships, some of us have never learned how to remove this mask and we haven't removed the mask even for ourselves, mm -hmm. even in the mirror. And so with that, we have to get to a point where we're like, okay, I'm going to be vulnerable in safe spaces so that God can begin to heal us from the shame, from the grief, from the loss. And that healing is a process, but it starts with us removing the mask. And then that also by the removal of the mask, you gain emotional intelligence, which helps to helps you to navigate all of these things. And, um, I think, Jocelyn, that it's a life journey. I don't think that it's like a, you know, it's like, it's not, it's like playing Monopoly. Like my kids and I had a Monopoly game that went for months because we were really good. Actually, we are really good Monopoly players and very competitive. So it was for months. Every time somebody came over, they would move and do whatever. Um, but that you are learning along the way, the moves of others. You're learning how to navigate the board of life if you want to look at it as, as a game. I, I sort of kind of from time to time think it is, but I know I give it more respect than that. And and you, you but you, you adjust, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm in my 60s now and I've had to adjust the way I exercise, the way I eat how much sleep I get, you know, it was like, okay, if you want to live this life and not retire and, you know, like the world says you should, then you've got to do this so that you can remain, you know, cause, cause the expectation of others is also the other reason we put the mask on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because when, I, when people figure out how old I am, they expect me to be tired. Right, you should Dude, be far tired. From tired. I'm far from tired. <laughs> I get tired at night, but I'm not tired. You know, that's I'm not, right. I'm not tired. Okay, that's right. So, so when we're caregivers and when we're care partners, mm -hmm. we're constantly restoring that thing so we we can we can 
be on the race with our loved one. And so in your book, I know you talk about that mask, breaking that mask, but the mask that the caregiver wears is the one that they're always saying they're okay. Mm. And, and you know, what, what I'm saying is, and again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't say you're okay if you're okay, but I find it a hundred, I find it impossible to be okay 365 days out of the year, 24 right. seven. Right. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. Cause the world is too hard for that. You are right. I think that there is this pressure for caregivers to keep it all together yeah. when none of us were designed to have it all together. And we all need help. We all need breaks. We all have these emotions that God has given us. Sadness, anger, frustration. These are real. But we've become masters at suppressing that for the sake of the comfort of others and that's doing us harm that's why we you know this that caregivers they are sometimes in worse shape in terms of health because they have neglected to care for themselves for so long saying that they're okay mm -hmm. one of the best gifts that you can give to yourself is being honest about the fact that you're not okay you don't have it all together and yep. you need support, even if it's just an hour on someone's couch, a counselor talking and saying, I am tired. Like, I love my spouse or whoever you're caring for, mother, father, but mm -hmm. they're driving me crazy right now. And yeah. being in community with other people who have also walked a similar path. So you can have those real conversations. Mm -hmm. I always stress that for caregivers that you need to be in community because it could be really lonely. Yes. Because you're constantly focusing on the person that you're caring for and have very little time or space for your own needs. And it's a lot. And so being able to say that is 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 healthy to be honest about how you feel and remove that mask. Yes. Oh my gosh. And friends, did okay. <laughs> there it is, you know. There it is, is it's it's that thing where I told you and somebody got really angry with me because I said that I am going to go off the grid. So last Saturday, really? I decided I had to go off the grid, Jocelyn. I had I a lot of stuff at work. I don't know what was happening. There was just some energy that was going on inside of me. And I said to my daughter, I have to get to the water. You've got mm -hmm. to come and take me to the beach because mm -hmm. that's my place. That's my the forest and the, and the water. Mm -hmm. I couldn't wait till Saturday came and she came and we went to the beach and we walked on the beach with the dogs and, and, you know, and, and not talking very much, honestly, really not really sharing a lot of conversation until we got back in the car. But I got an email from somebody, a frantic email that I read on Monday <laughs> And the person was like, I tried to get a hold of you all weekend. So I said, was it emergency? Oh, no, I just wanted to. So, folks, we got to stop doing this to each other. Mm -hmm. When a person doesn't answer your text, your call, don't assume that it's about you. That's right. Maybe they're a caregiver or a care partner or a parent that's getting that one moment, that one space of time of peace and quiet. And as much as you may need to have a conversation with them, they need the peace. Yes. Yes. Right? Amen. And I'll say to that. <laughs> mm -hmm. They need the peace and you need to be a good friend. You need to be a good community, human being person when in relationship to that. So mm -hmm. I, our time is up with Dr. Jocelyn and uh, Reverend Dr. Jocelyn. And, um, but I want to make sure that you know, and Felicia will put, I always do this. I don't ever see it myself, <laughs> but I do this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she'll put it down there wherever down there is <laughs> wonderful you can get to the website 
And um, please reach out and get the book, Breaking the Power um, of the Mask. And as I always say to you, if you can afford to buy two books, you always buy two. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, in the last two decades of my life, that's been a practice because, as you know, reading is my thing. Um, I and I give it to someone else. So, and I don't I don't want to always give mine because I put marks in it. I write in it because uh, writing sermons and doing the things that I do, I rely on the wisdom of others. Like so, I'll you know that's why if you ever come to hear me speak, you might hear me say, Reverend Jocelyn Jones says in her book. Breaking the Power of the Mask, because I read it, right? Okay. Awesome. And you have to give credit. You can't steal stuff, people. That's right. <laughs> Golly. You know, I mean, some ideas are universal ideas, but when they're very specific, don't steal them, because I've seen that happen um, many, many times. Okay, let me get back to the topic. Get the book, buy two books, give one away, you read the other, and then write questions in it, and we'll have Reverend Jocelyn back so that we can have a time when we can do a real online Q&A. So do that for me. Do that and we'll figure it out. Maybe it's in the spring. Maybe it's in the fall. Who knows? The universe will tell us when it's time. But mm -hmm. if you do that, then you will uh, walk away with some information that will help you take off the mask. And know that that mask wasn't necessarily put on by you. Could have been. Might have been but it might've been put on by life circumstances. Mm -hmm. And getting this book also will be a beginning. It's always a beginning to the journey, friends. Always a beginning. But in our last moments, uh, Reverend Jocelyn Jones, give us your sort of parting words and we'll close. If you will stay on the line, we'll close and then I can say goodbye to you personally. Yes, yes. Well, thank you again for having me here. It's a, it's a joy to talk about this because we have to always be reminded how fragile life is and how precious every moment, as you mentioned, with holding your grandbaby is so precious. And so we have to be intentional about every moment, love hard, create memories. And like I mentioned with my dad, even though he could not remember what took place in those moments, if we live life for the moments, that's what brings joy. And so I'm challenging myself and you to live each moment like it's your last with your loved ones, create memories, love hard, and you'll have a really good life when you do that. Amen. Amen. So friends, you know how we end Every Friday, every Friday, you know, um, suicide and depression and anxiety are, are my big deal because I live with, um, I've lived through all three of those, okay. honestly and candidly, you already know. Um, but 988 is, a, lot, is a, a number, not hard to forget, easy to remember. You can text, you can call. You can, um, oh, and I learned the other day, and I'm sorry I've neglected our Latino, Hispanic brothers and sisters. They, they got folks there, okay? They've got folks who can talk to you and get you through this moment. I know that life is hard. And in that dark, dark moment when you think that the world will be better off without you because nobody sees you, I want you to know that life is a sacred journey sees you. And if I could reach out to you, I would. But I can't be everywhere. But 988 can be. So call 988. The other is I have a heart, as you well know, for young adults, emancipated foster youth. The youth crisis line is a 24-7 crisis line. It's anonymous, safe, and confidential. If you are a young person out there, you've been emancipated, you've had to run away from a home where the grown-ups were, were unhealthy and you needed to get healthy, dial this number. 1-800-843-5200. There will be people there to help you, get you resources, get you out of your situation. You are not alone. And I'm sorry. And I'm sorry. But you know what? Help is on the way if you dial 1-800-843-5200. All right, you, my friends, my family across the universal divide, wherever you are, Please get out into the world. Go to a forest, hug a tree. You know how I feel about trees. Hug that tree, feel life permeating through you from that tree. 
You know how I feel about the animals. If you can go to the shelter and pet a cat, pet a dog, a red, a bunny, do whatever. And reach out and touch another person that you haven't spoken to in a while and let them know that you've been thinking about them. And even if they don't pick up the phone, don't get it, make it personal. Leave them a message of love. As uh, Jocelyn said, love hard. Start this weekend, love hard, but let it begin with you. All right, life is a sacred journey, loves you. We'll see you next Friday morning and be good to yourself. And while you're being good to some to yourself, you'll make the world a better place. All right, take care, peace.